everyone. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about properties of matter. So properties of matter is basically the second topic that we would talk about when we talk about matter in general. The first being our three states of matter that we find on Earth, which would be solid, liquid, and gas. And with these three state of matters, we also know the different characteristics. That solid has the most amount of uh, bonds holding the particles together, making it have a specific volume and shape. Liquids have less bonds holding the particles together than solids, making sure that it has a specific volume, but not a specific shape, because it takes the shape of its container that's in. And then gas has no bonds holding the particles together, making, making it not have any specific shape or any specific volume. So what we're going to be doing today is going through our key properties of matter. So the first thing that we really need to talk about is the difference between non-characteristic and characteristic properties. So when we're looking at a non-characteristic property, we're looking at properties that can apply to more than one um, substance. And when we mean that it can apply to more than one substance, it can describe multiple substances. So things like mass, things like volume, temperature, things like um, acidity and uh, basicity. So also can be described as alkalinity, so how much of an acid or how much of a base something is. Now, um, some people considered acidity and alkalinity a characteristic property. Some people consider it a non-characteristic property. Um, for this video, we're going to consider it non-characteristic because you can actually have a lot of substance, substances that has the same pH value, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit later. Now, something that is characteristic, on the other hand, can only apply to one specific substance. So it is a property that that substance alone has. Now, with characteristic properties, um, there's much less than with non-characteristic properties for the obvious reason that it only describes one particular substance. And the key characteristic properties that we're going to be talking about is density, talking about boiling point and melting point. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start talking about the specific properties and we're going to be starting with our non-characteristic properties first. So let's get started on that. Our first key non-characteristic property is mass. And mass is described as the amount of matter in an object. And we need to remember that when we're talking about matter, we're talking about the number of particles, which uh, we know are our atoms. So if I have a high number of particles, that means I have a lot of atoms, that means I have a high mass. If I have a low number of particles, that means I have less atoms, that means I have a low mass. Now, mass is actually measured in the unit of grams. And a lot of the time, uh, if I have very, very high, uh, large items or very, very small items, I might use uh, different prefixes of my basic unit of grams. So for instance, if I have very, very large items that are relatively heavy, I might use something called the kilogram. And the kilogram is 1,000 uh, 1, grams. So this would be, so if I have uh, an item that has a mass of 1,000 grams, it would equal one kilogram. So the kilogram, 1,000 grams equals one kilogram. Now, if I have small items, I would use something like the milligram. So if I'm looking at my milligram, it's the 
smaller side of my kilogram. So one thousandth, so 0 0.001 grams equals one milligram. Now to measure mass, we use an electronic balance. And the way that we use an electronic balance is, is quite simple. We take our item and we put it on the balance. So for solids, it's really simple. I just basically take my item, put it on my balance. For liquids, it's a two-step process, right? So let's say I was trying to figure out the mass of my solid. So I take my object and let's say it's an orange. I put it on my electronic balance. And then my readout screen would tell me the mass. So in this case, it is one gram. Easier said than done. Now with liquids, because liquids don't have a specific shape, they take the shape of their container, it's a two-step process. And what we would have to do is we would first have to get the mass of our empty container and then put our liquid in the container and get the mass of our now filled container. So I have right here my uh, empty graduated cylinder on my balance and the empty container has a mass of 10 grams. So this would be my initial mass. Then what I would have to do is take the same container that I just massed, pour my liquid in it. Okay, so I have my container, I've poured my liquid in the container and now it says my mass is now 13 grams. So this is my final mass. And to figure out the mass of my liquid, I need to subtract the mass of the empty container. So the equation that I'm using, so mass equals mass final minus mass initial. So in this case, it would be 13 grams minus 10 grams, which gives me three grams. Same basic procedure that I'm taking my item and put it on my electronic balance, but for liquids, I have to do that extra step because it doesn't have a specific shape. So now, So now what we're going to be doing, sorry, for a second I thought it wasn't recording. For now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about uh, the next characteristic property, which is volume. So when we're looking at volume, we're looking at how much space the matter occupies. So in this case, we're looking at how spread out or how clumped. So if my item is spread out, it would have a large volume. And if my item is clumped, it would have a small volume. So we're really talking about for volume, we're talking about the shape and how big or how small it is. Now with volume, um, the unit depends on if I'm talking about solids or if I'm talking about liquids. So if I'm talking about solids, my unit is going to be centimeter cubed. And we actually calculate this mathematically by using my equation of volume is equal to length times width times height. Now, the thing that I need to remember, if I'm using this equation, I can only use this for regular shaped objects. So that means objects where I can actually measure my length, my width, and my height, right? So if we're looking at a shape that I've drawn down here, so this would be my length, this would be my width, this would be my height. And I would be able to calculate it mathematically by taking those measurements. Now, let's say, um, and this works for solids. Now for liquids, my unit is actually liters. Now, just like when we were talking about with um, mass, 
that my basic unit is grams. And if I have very, very heavy items, I would use kilograms. And if I have very, very small items, I would use milligrams. Uh, well, the same thing applies with liquids. So if I have very, very small amount of liquids, I would use something called a milliliter. And a milliliter is one thousandth of a liter. So one milliliter is equal to 0 0.001 liters. Now, um, for the flip side, if I'm looking at very, very big volumes, I can use something called a kiloliter, which would be 1,000 liters. Um, it's not wildly used, but it does also apply. Now, to figure out the volume of liquids, uh, I actually just use very uh, intricate glassware. So a lot of the time when I'm looking at the volume of a liquid, I would use things like graduated cylinders. And graduated cylinders are basically like rulers for liquids. They're very precise glassware, and each increment tells me my specific volume of my liquid. So to figure out the volumes of liquids, it's really simple. I take my liquid, I pour it into my graduated cylinder, and the level that my graduated cylinder, where the, where the liquid uh, meets, would be the volume of my, my liquid. Now, Sometimes with, um, to figure out volume for solids that don't have a specific shape, we would do something called water displacement. And water displacement is looking at how much water is moved when I put an object into uh, my graduated cylinder. And this is actually a really um, important uh, thing to do to figure out the volume of items because a lot of the time as much as we would love to calculate the volume of our solids by using volume is equal to length width times height most of the time our objects are not perfectly uh, shaped where we can measure all of the the sides so the other thing that we would have to do is something called water displacement And the concept is quite simple. So the first thing that you would have is you would have a graduated cylinder with a certain amount of water in it. So let's say this was my graduated cylinder and I had 10 milliliters of water in it. Then what I would do is I would take my unknown object. So let's say it's a ring. So I have my ring and I would put the ring inside my graduated cylinder. So then I would have the graduated cylinder, I would have the ring in the graduated cylinder, and then my water level would have now risen. And my new water level is now 14 milliliters. So to figure out the volume of my ring, well, what I am doing is very similar to what we did in the previous slide when we were talking about mass. So my volume of water without the ring is my initial volume. My volume of water with the ring is my final volume. And to find the volume of my object, I'm doing my final volume minus my initial volume. So that would be 14 milliliters minus 10 milliliters. So my ring has uh, displaced four milliliters of water. So that means my volume of my ring is four centimeters cubed. What we're now gonna go on to is talk about temperature. So when we're talking about temperature, we're talking about how fast my particles move. So one, uh, one thing that I want to specify is this word agitation. So when we're talking about something that is agitating, we're talking about um, movement. 
Now, things that have high movement means that it has high energy. And it releases this energy in the form of lots of heat. Things that have low movement have low energy, so they don't actually release a lot of heat. So it would feel cold. So as it sounds, um, when we're talking about temperature, the way that we actually measure um, temperature is using a degree Celsius. Now, the reason why we're saying degree Celsius in, in Canada, we use the metric system, so it would be degree Celsius. Um, if we were in the United States, we would use degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and there's a lot of other uh, different units of temperature, but the one that we're gonna be really using a lot is uh, degree Celsius. Now, to measure temperature, we use a thermometer. Now, um, a lot of you probably have, you know, temperature apps on your phone, so you just open it up and be like, oh, it's 10 degrees outside or 15 degrees outside. But uh, in the lab, we use thermometers. And what we, what basically a thermometer is, it's a, a glass cylinder with a liquid inside. And when I put it in another object, if the object is hot, the liquid rises to the level where it has in the instrumentation. And if it's cold, the liquid falls. So temperature, um, how much my particle is moving. The more they move, the more energy they have, the more heat they give off. The less they move, the less energy they have, the colder they feel. Now, the last property that we're gonna be talking about is acidity and basicity, or alkalinity. And a lot of people, sometimes, some people consider this characteristic, some people consider this non-characteristic. For the purpose of this video, we're gonna be considering it non-characteristic because uh, you can have a lot of substances that are acids that have the same pH level. You can have a lot of substances that are bases that are, have the same pH level. So uh, when we're talking about an acid or a base, um, for our purposes, it's basically whether the substance is an acid or a base. Now, the unit that we have is something called our pH scale. And our pH scale is a scale between 0 and 14. And right in the middle would be 7. So anything that is below 7, so anything between 0 and 6.9 is defined as an acid. Anything that is above 7, so 7.1 to 14, is considered a base. And anything that is exactly 7 is neutral. Now, uh, to figure out if your substance is an acid or a base, we can use something, and this is the thing that we use in the lab, is litmus paper. Now, we actually have two types of litmus paper. We have red litmus paper, and we have blue litmus paper. And it's the reaction of both the red litmus paper and the blue litmus paper that lets us know if we have an acid, a base, or a neutral substance. So if we have an acid, both papers turn red. So that means my red litmus paper stays red and my blue litmus paper turns red. If I have a base, the key color that's turning is blue, meaning that my red litmus paper turns blue and my blue litmus paper stays blue. And if my substance is neutral, I actually have no color change. So my red paper stays red, my blue paper stays blue. So these are our non-characteristic properties. What we're now going to talk about is our characteristic properties. So our first key characteristic property is density. And density by definition is mass per unit volume. 
Now, density actually has to be calculated. Now, because our de definition is mass per unit volume, density is calculated by getting the mass of your object and dividing it by the volume of your object. So density is a characteristic property because it doesn't matter how much of a particular substance you have or the volume of a particular substance. If I know that my substance is gold, it will have the same density, whether it is a gold ring or a bar of gold. Same thing that if my substance is made out of iron, it is going to have the same density, whether it is a, an iron fence or an iron keychain. So density is calculated by taking the mass and dividing it by its volume. Now the unit is going to be, because if I'm looking at density as mass divided by volume, for solids my unit is grams per centimeter cubed because the mass of my my solid is in grams, the volume of my solid is measured in centimeters cubed. If I'm talking about liquids, well, the unit is going to be grams per milliliters because mass, again, is measured in grams and volume is measured in milliliters. Our next uh, characteristic property is boiling point. And when we're talking about boiling point, we're talking about the temperature that I undergo the phase change of boiling. So boiling point is a characteristic property because specific substances will undergo the phase change at specific temperatures. So if I'm looking at water, water is defined by a substance that boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So the boiling point for water would be 100 degrees Celsius. And different substances are going to have different boiling points. So um, another example would be rubbing alcohol. So isopropanol, um, its boiling point is actually lower than water's. Its boiling point is actually 82.5 degrees Celsius. Um, now liquids would have a variety of boiling points. Metals and solids would have extremely high boiling points. So if we're looking at, for instance, um, typical metal like iron, its boiling point is 2,862 degrees Celsius. So uh, all of these substances you can basically figure out based on what temperature they boil at. Now, similar to boiling point is melting point. So melting point is when solid changes to a liquid. So if we're looking at water, its melting point is at zero degrees Celsius. Now, if I'm looking at different substances, it will have different melting points. So let's take, uh, for instance, iron. Its boiling point was almost 3000 degrees Celsius. Its melting point is a little bit lower, but still relatively high. Its melting point is 1538 degrees Celsius. Lower than 3,000, but still high. So uh, I hope that goes over the different characteristic uh, properties of matter and the non-characteristic properties of matter, and I hope this was really helpful. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.